Today is February 27th, 2022, and we have a very special guest uh, back on the show today, Gerald Horn. Dr. Horn currently holds the Morris Professorship of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. Pr Professor Horn is an activist, scholar, researcher, archivist, author, historian, and much, much more. Professor Horn has written over 45 books and is considered one of the most prolific, prolific writers of all time. He has written on a wide range of topics exploring issues of racism, white supremacy, liberation and labor movements, internationalism, and Professor Horn has even written books on Hollywood, the film industry, jazz and the music industry, and boxing. Professor Horn is interviewed almost daily on a broad range of social and political historical topics. Um, you can find Professor Horn's interviews, lectures, and latest writings on Facebook and YouTube. And you can check out the Gerald Horn nine-part biography series on this channel, Activist News Network. Um, and Professor Horn also, ha also hosts a radio show entitled Freedom Now, which airs on KP KPFK 90.7 FM on Saturdays at 11, 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. It is without a doubt the best radio show in all of the lands. Well, Professor Horn, welcome back to the show. Uh, very excited to have you back on. Thank you for inviting me. And for anybody who's interested, KPFK is in Los Angeles, kpfk.org. Um, and today I wanted to discuss with you the conflict in the Ukraine. Um, it seems to me that too many of our friends on the left are analyzing uh, Russia's attack in the Ukraine this week, either incorrectly or at a minimum incompletely. Um, and it seems that Putin and Russia have been mislabeled as the aggressor in this conflict between the US and NATO. Um, and I wanted to get your take on that. Do you, is that a correct analysis? Well, point number one is that to the extent that many of our friends on the left uh, may be misled and misguided with regard to the current crisis, uh, to a historian should not come as something new because I'm old enough to remember when many of our friends on the left were act acting as cheerleaders for the decomposition of the Warsaw Pact. I assumed that they thought that the regimes in Eastern Europe uh, after 1989 would be replaced by social democrats, but of course uh, that did not happen, not least because our friends on the left were not in the driver's seat, at best they were a caboose on that train and US imperialism was in the driver's seat. And so surprise, surprise, what happens is that you have a regime in Poland that now is talking about establishing a so-called Fort Trump. And many of the former <laughs> socialist regimes of Eastern Europe and part of the Warsaw Pact are now part of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, which according to some accounts has doubled in size since 1997 including such minnows as North Macedonia and Montenegro, which then obligates them under the NATO concept of interoperability to dip into their treasuries and buy more weapons from Raytheon, the former home of Pentagon chief Lloyd Austin, or um, Lockheed Martin. So in order to understand this crisis, I'm not sure if understanding who should be labeled the aggressor is the best approach. I mean, I recall the Korean War, June 26, 1950, the war on the Korean Peninsula. There's still a debate amongst historians as to who is responsible for starting that conflict. Most of the United States blame the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, North Korea. Bruce Cummings of the University of Chicago, who was a leading, the leading US scholar uh, on that conflict, does not necessarily agree. And he says that that's not necessarily the best question to ask. And looking at Ukraine, Russia, you can understand his point of view because to use an analogy, if you pull a gun on me and I slap you, and then we get into a tussle and a fracas, well, are you responsible since you pulled a gun on me or am I responsible? since I ignited hostilities. That is to say that uh, for years now, but particularly since the so-called Maidan revolt of 2014, February, uh, when a regime sympathetic to 
Moscow was dislodged and this, this current crew came to power, uh, you've had um, difficulties, to put it mildly, uh, between uh, Ukraine and Russia. And so the initial question is, why does the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which came into existence in 1949 on an explicitly anti-Moscow basis, anti-Soviet basis, why didn't it collapse after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991? Instead, it incorporated all the members, not all, many of the members of the Warsaw Pact, the former socialist grouping, and they were rechristened as NATO, and then put missiles or bases uh, aimed at Moscow. Uh, Moscow has been complaining about this most bitterly, uh, as noted at the Munich Security Conference of 2007, where President Putin raised searching questions, but of course those were dismissed just as the architect of the Cold War. Speaking of the late George Kennan, who wrote the long telegram in the journal Foreign Affairs in 1947, laying out the rationale for the Cold War with Moscow, even he, in his dying days, suggested that enlarging NATO was a mistake. Tom Friedman of the New York Times, who usually goes along with every harebrained scheme that U.S. imperialism comes up with, in his most recent column, uh, actually agreed. And people on the left should ask this question, uh, which is, after the communists were overthrown and nationalists came to power in Moscow, why did U.S. imperialism pivot and try to incorporate Russia, as they did for a while in the G8? Of course, now it's the G7 because Russia was expelled, particularly since they also have this idea that uh, China is the ball game that speaks to Mr. Obama's pivot to Asia. Mr. Biden has said the same thing. And I think many might be befuddled by the fact that if China is the ball game, why didn't, after the collapse of socialism in the Soviet Union, or even more recently, uh, why weren't overtures made to Moscow in order to encircle China? Well, apparently what's happening is that uh, the present United Russia Party uh, in Moscow is not willing to play that game. And so what we're faced with now is either regime change in Kiev or regime change in Moscow. If the latter takes place, what you'll see, of course, is that China will be encircled. It's difficult to confront China directly because to confront China directly, you have to confront Tesla and Microsoft and Apple and GM and KFC and Starbucks and uh, other leading US firms. So the plan apparently is to weaken Moscow, if not have regime change, and then have a friendly regime in Moscow that then can encircle China and then, like a viper, strangle China. Now, that's obviously rather ambitious, but if you look at what's happening in the last few days, it gives one pause. For example, we see that uh, Russia is in the process of being expelled partially from the SWIFT system, the interbank system, which allows for payments across borders. This could lead to a tightening relation between Moscow and Beijing under a Beijing-led equivalent of the SWIFT system. Recall that the late Zbigniew Brzezinski, the national security advisor under Jimmy Carter, in some ways responsible for the debacles which U.S. imperialism now faces insofar as he was the architect of the alliance with religious zealotry in Afghanistan, which helped to lead to the Soviet Union collapse. But uh, he argued in one of his last books, The Grand Chessboard, that Washington should be on guard against a Russia-China-Iran de facto alliance, which is basically what's shaping up as we speak. At the same time, you see uh, 
that with this pressure on Moscow, it also helps to deal with a second problem of U.S. imperialism. Recall that uh, Jane, uh, Mr. Bolton, John Bolton, the disgraced national security advisor under Trump in his memoir, uh, talks, says that Mr. Trump and those he represented uh, saw and see the European Union as second only to China as the antagonist of choice. And so with this current conjuncture that we face, we see that the vassal status of the EU will be reinforced. You see that already. And by the way, perhaps the most concerning aspect coming out of this whole crisis for progressive humanity is Germany turning towards militarism. I mean, didn't these people learn the lessons of the 20th century with regard to World War I and World War II? And this recent announcement by Germany of increasing military spending and sending more offensive weapons to Ukraine is very dangerous. Obviously, Moscow has to take it very seriously, uh, given the immense damage inflicted upon the Soviet Union uh, by the Nazis. But in any case, that's the illogic of U.S. policy as we speak. And so with this pressure on Moscow, this vassal status of the European Union will be increased. Germany, according to Chancellor Schultz, will also be building more liquefied natural gas ports to take more liquefied natural gas from Texas, Louisiana, as opposed to Russia, uh, which that's one of the reasons why I, I think in Houston, where I'm speaking, I hear all these uh, corks and champagne bottles popping uh, all over town. Uh, because of the profits that would be flowing into the Petro Metro, as Houston is called. By the way, uh, many people in the United States have an immense stake in this conflict, not only in terms of war and peace, not only in terms of Moscow putting its military on high alert with regard to its nuclear force uh, just today, February 27, uh, which should be of concern to us all, uh, but also with regard to energy, already in Los Angeles, uh, a gallon of gas at the pump is $6 plus. You can expect that to go up in light of, of this sanctions regime uh, on Moscow. Likewise, if you heat your home with oil or natural gas, expect those prices to go up too. So this is a very uh, serious crisis that, that we face. And rather than, or uh, strike that, secondarily, after, secondarily, we should be issuing editorial denunciations. Primarily, we should be trying to do an analysis of what's going on, such as what I just presented to you in terms of ultimate effects. Tighten China, Russia alliance, tighten EU, US alliance, prices of energy going up, uh, et cetera. Now, after you do that analysis, then you know we'll we'll be willing to entertain your editorial denunciations of one party or another, which leads me to my second point, and this is something part of what I'm about to say with regard to the long history of European affairs and European history. One of the reasons this hasn't been articulated, I think, is because of the structure of knowledge, the epistemological question, as they call it. Uh, that is to say that in, in these universities, people study a, a piece of the elephant. Maybe they'll study the trunk or maybe they'll study the tail. In other words, even people who consider themselves to be specialists uh, in European affairs, maybe they didn't study Russia, maybe they didn't study Russia from 1917 to 1945 or 1945 to 1991. But here's the deal with regard to Russia and Europe. For centuries now, when the Western Europeans were sailing west across the Atlantic to plunder the Americas and south towards Africa to pillage the African continent and growing fat in the process, Russia was moving east, oftentimes at the expense of China, by the way. Vladivostok, its window on the Pacific was established in 1860, for example. And so you have this anomaly, this contradiction, this disjuncture in terms of European politics, whereby the so-called wealthy Western European countries, London and Paris in the first instance, which were supposedly world powers, were not necessarily dominant 
in their backyard, the European continent. If you look at your map, most of European territory is Russia. Most of European natural resources are in Russian soil, be it gold, oil, aforementioned natural gas. Russia's population, even after the denuding of the former Soviet Union, is about twice the size of number two, the Federal Republic of Germany. And so this was noticed by many of the Western Europeans, uh, which 200 years ago led Napoleon Bonaparte of France to try to conquer Russia. Of course, he had his hat handed to him. In the 1850s, you had the Crimea conflict where London, Paris, and the sick man of Europe, speaking of Ottoman Turkey, gang up on Russia. Interestingly enough, Ben Wallace, the military chief in London, raised the ominous specter of a repeat of the Crimean War, as it was called. And for those, some of you may remember uh, Lord Alfred Lord Tennyson's uh, poems about the Crimean War, the charge of the Light Brigade and all that comes out of directly out of that conflict. And of course, in the piece de resistance, in 1905, uh, London sponsors the Japanese attack on Russia, which of course leads directly not only to the Bolshevik Revolution, but in a spectacular miscalculation helps to bulk up Tokyo to the point where it delivers a devastating blow to the British Empire in 1941, 1942, by seizing Hong Kong and Singapore. Of course, that book, Race War, deals with that in part. And then a few decades later, and interestingly enough, we're marking the 50th anniversary, uh, after the baton has passed from London to Washington, after that devastating blow by Germany and Japan during World War II, the United States takes uh, London's place, and then it does the same thing by effectuating this entente with uh, China. In 1972, February 1972, uh, which of course leads to massive direct foreign investment uh, into China, creating this juggernaut, uh, which of course has led to the present crisis because the North Atlantic countries feel they're becoming dangerously dependent upon China. And so therefore we are now perhaps at the brink of a nuclear uh, exchange. Now, Russia was not necessarily standing still as these plots were unfolding. Interestingly enough, uh, as a footnote, uh, during the US Civil War, when France basically supported the Confederates, my next book on Texas will deal with that at some length, by the way. Uh, in fact, just as a teaser, uh, after Appomattox, April 9, 1865, when the Confederates supposedly surrendered, recall that the French had taken over Mexico, that leads to the Chicano holiday, Cinco de Mayo, and all the Confederates begin to move to Mexico because they're going to have a rear guard campaign against the U.S. from Mexico. And in fact, uh, reinstall enslavement of Africans, which of course have been abolished, uh, depending on the date you choose, 1829, 1837, which then of course leads to Texas seceding from Mexico. England, of course, uh, wanted to recognize the Confederacy, but its working class prevented it. Of course, Russia, was one, along with Haiti, was one of the few powers to stand alongside Washington, which makes it ironic since these are two of the most uh, despised regimes in 2022, Moscow and Port-au-Prince. And then, of course, that leads to this uh, spectacular uh, misplay when Russia sells what it doesn't control, actually, speaking of Alaska in 1867 to the United States for a mere $6 million, which then becomes the 49th US state. I mean, that's how close, um, because I, I understand as, as I deepen my study of history, why there have been these uh, huge misjudgments of the US, because the US, it oftentimes did come into conflict with London it oftentimes did come into conflict with France, which then leads progressives to think, oh, you know, the United States, they must be progressive. Supposedly they had this grand rev revolution, et cetera. But in retrospect, we can just see they were just trying to replace London and, 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 and Paris, which of course has happened. But in any case, to go back to my thread about uh, Russia not standing still, Many 
in our community, excuse me, the black community, celebrate understandably and justifiably the Abyssinian, Ethiopian defeat of the Italian invaders in the 1890s. It's like 1905. It, it really is seen as a blow to white supremacy. Uh, what's not necessarily recognized is that the Abyssinians were armed to the teeth by Russia. And this is part of this uh, Russia countering uh, the Western Europeans by weakening their colonial system. Uh, it, it, it's one of the reasons today, you might have noticed that the, today at the United Nations, there was a vote on castigating uh, Russia and the Security Council because of Ukraine. Of course, Russia vetoed it, but abstaining were China, India. India, of course, uh, since independence in 1947, uh, has had as one of its chief allies, Moscow, not least because of the conflict between uh, Indian independence fighters and London, whereas Moscow weighed in on behalf of Indian independence fighters. Now, the other abstention was, was by United Arab Emirates. I, I, have, I have to say I haven't investigated that to figure, it, figure that one out, uh, but uh, stay tuned. But also, as you know, uh, Russia supported the liberation movements in Southern Africa. That's to say the Soviet Union. Uh, perhaps they would not have gotten the arms that they got to become independent, uh, particularly in the, from 1970s up to South African independence in 1994, uh, we talk about the Cuban troops, of course, but of course the Cubans are mostly using uh, Russian material uh, or Soviet military material. So what I'm trying to suggest is that there's an underlying contradiction with regard to European affairs that's still working itself out, whereby it doesn't seem that world imperialism can function effectively with a functional regime in Moscow. That's why things went so well for Washington when Yeltsin and the sellout regime was in power. And it reminds me in a sense of how uh, US imperialism deals with the black community. They don't like the socialists like Robeson. They don't like the nationalists either, like Malcolm X. So they didn't like, so the United States waged a multi-trillion dollar Cold War against socialist republics of the Soviet Union. They didn't like them. Now you got nationalists in power. They don't like them either. <laughs> but I, I think that before some sort of accident happens and the world is blown up and humanity is extinguished, uh, we're going to have to convince uh, the North Atlantic powers of what I just explained to you, that they may not be able to resolve uh, frontally this contradiction of Russia being the major power on the European continent. And certainly this circuitous plan of trying to weaken Russia as a stepping stone to weakening China, it's sort of a Rube Goldberg type plan. You can't confront China directly, so you weaken its partner. It's like a, a bank shot if you're playing billiards. Uh, we, we have to convince them that uh, that's similarly misguided and uh, can only lead in, leave, uh, end in tears. And, and speaking of which, it, it seems to me that what's really going on, and I think this is kind of what you outlined, is that the, um, the U.S. and, and so somewhat of a lesser extent, it's, it's NATO sidekicks, they want to maintain this unipolar world, this hegemonic world, and China, Russia, and, and much of the, the rest of the world are, are embracing what, what is already existing, which is a multipolar world. And I wonder if kicking uh, Russia out of SWIFT will just fast forward the, you know, the, the, you know, this multipolar world and, and, and ways for the other countries to get around U.S. sanctions. I think that's a distinct possibility. And um, also, I think we need to look at the rest of the world. I mean, I already mentioned India and the United Arab Emirates with regard to the Security Council. Uh, I expect uh, other countries to hedge. <laughs> For example, the Brazilians, either under Bolsonaro, the current leader, or hopefully his replacement, Lula da Silva, uh, 
Uh, I don't think that they'll be in solidarity with U.S. imperialism, particularly in light of the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Uh, I expect Japan to play a double game. Uh, they supposedly are on side with regard to the G7 sanctions. But of course, Japan has a passionate desire to have the Kuril Islands, K-U-R-I-L-E Islands, which Moscow seized after 1945 and Japan's defeat. Japan wants those returned. You might recall that uh, during the Winter Olympics in Sochi, that uh, there was this boycott because of the Crimea crisis. Japan did not observe the boycott. Uh, the prime minister was in the box opening ceremonies with uh, President Putin. And in light of that, I probably would expect South Korea to follow suit, uh, not because South Korea sees itself uh, as an extension of Japan, of course, perish the thought, but they have to worry about being outflanked diplomatically in terms of their longstanding conflict uh, with Tokyo. And of course, now they have conflicts with China too, uh, which does not bode well. Speaking of which, you, you've also seen a tightening of relations between the Democratic People's Republic of Korea uh, and Beijing. So in some ways, I think we're living through a, a fraught historical moment that uh, however and whenever this crisis ends, we'll be faced with a new correlation of forces. Uh, that is to say, if there's regime change in Kiev, we'll be faced with a new correlation of forces. And certainly if there's regime change in Moscow, we'll definitely be faced with a new correlation of forces. And that's what I would like our friends on the left to apply their mental energy to, to figure out what's going on, to do an analysis of the forces, to not only look at how US reacts, uh, but look at how other countries are, re are reacting because that'll determine the correlation of forces. And if you're going to analyze the United States, one of the questions you should ask yourself is, at least one of the questions I ask, is that, the black community, generally speaking, votes more heavily against the right than any other demographic, nine to one, eight to two. And yet black political leaders and intellectuals are generally missing in action with regard to this crisis. Now, I would argue that this is a direct result of the compromise of 1954, uh, whereby in return for anti-Jim Crow concessions, uh, the black community had to throw overboard as internationalist forces led by the great late Paul Robeson, and that has led to us being handicapped going forward. And in fact, it's led to the further empowerment, further empowerment of the Hawks in the Democratic Party, which then leads the country and the world to the brink of disaster. Uh, speaking of which, I should also mention a couple of other points, uh, which is that the United States threatened to blow up the world in 1962, during the so-called Cuban Missile Crisis, when the Soviet Union placed defensive missiles in Cuba, uh, of course, that was negotiated and uh, the United States removed its missiles from Turkey, although that got lost sight of and Soviets replaced their missiles, uh, took their missiles back from uh, Cuba. But it, it bespeaks the kind of hypocrisy that you see in Washington. And also you see hypocrisy with regard to secessionist movements because uh, part of the crisis was triggered by Russia a few days ago, recognizing the Donbass territory as being separate from the larger Ukraine. And of course, the United States acted as the midwife for South Sudan seceding from the larger Sudan more than a decade ago. And even though you have all this blather and bloviation about how the, Europe has not faced a crisis of this magnitude since 1945, the end of World War II, these analysts must have forgotten the former Yugoslavia uh, born, bombed into smithereens by NATO, the so-called defensive alliance, by the way, as we keep 
hearing. And uh, the United States acting as a midwife for the birth of Kosovo seceding from Serbia, not to mention Yugoslavia breaking apart into its con constituent components, including Croatia, Slovenia, Serbia, with, of course, uh, North Macedonia and Montenegro then <laughs> joining NATO. So uh, I think that part of the problem we face is that for various reasons, uh, there is uh, encrusted anti-Moscow sentiment in the United States. It's a legacy of the Cold War, clearly. And uh, the problem is, is that the encrusted anti-Moscow sentiment has now brought the planet to the blink, brink, brink of destruction. And uh, I would hope and imagine that our friends on the left <laughs> Uh, shall we say, would see that as catastrophic. Yeah, I wanted to add, and this is going back a little bit um, to the NATO expansion, um, and I'm just going to uh, share, try to share my screen. Um, the, um, you know, you had talked about this, but I wanted to highlight it for the audience that the collapse of the Soviet Union wa was, I believe, 1991. And you look at the years and, and NATO, correct me if I'm wrong, was established to counter uh, the Soviet Union. So you, one would think that NATO would um, would have, you know, would have stopped its stopped its existence after 1991. But as we see um, in in this map, that there was over 14 countries that joined NATO, um, almost all of them essentially encircling uh, joining NATO after 1991 almost all of them encircling Russia. Um, and the other point um, I wanted to mention um, was you talked about NATO being a defensive, supposedly a defensive entity, but not only has NATO acted in Europe, but also in, throughout Africa. Well, sure. Look at Libya, for example, uh, 2011, where uh, the United States and NATO ignored the entreaties from the African Union and President Zuma of South Africa for some sort of negotiated settlement. Instead, uh, bomb Libya, uh, leading to the death on camera of the leader, uh, Mr. Gaddafi, who, by the way, at the time, and continually, I should say, was being accused of passing under the table payments to then French President Fr uh, Nicolas Sarkozy. Uh, of course, dead men tell no tales, and France was a major hawk with regard to that uh, NATO campaign. I should also mention that during the time, perhaps understandably, uh, we've been focused on Eastern Europe. The United States is continually bombing Somalia uh, during the same time. And uh, I, I'm, I'm curious as to what is the uh, legal authorization for that, but apparently U.S. imperialism does not necessarily have to show legal authorization. And then, of course, Afghanistan was a NATO uh, adventure, ending ignominiously in August uh, 2021 with the helter-skelter evacuation of U.S. forces and U.S. NGOs and many of their Al Afghan friends and comrades. So uh, this idea about NATO being some sort of defensive Alliance. I mean, it's poppycock. It's balderdash. It's the looniest idea since Looney Tunes. It makes no sense. And I guess the last two points I wanted to ask you, and they're not necessarily related, um, was the role of this of the privatization of war or the profitization of war and the military military industrial complex. And the second is the the neo Nazi element within the Ukraine and the growing. Um, you know, far right movement in the U.S. Um, and, and what your thoughts are on those kind of two topics. Well, first of all, with regard to profiteering, uh, all you have to do is look at what Chancellor Schultz in Germany just announced. He's going to try to increase military spending uh, in Germany. Now, watch the, the stock market tomorrow. As a matter of fact, here's a stock tip for those who are shameless profiteers. You may, when the bell rings tomorrow, uh, 
put a bet on Lockheed Martin and Raytheon in light of what Chancellor Schultz announced today, Sunday, February 27th. Uh, war is oftentimes, you know, I'm doing this, this project on the uh, LA Black Panther Party, so I've been reading a lot of Huey Newton. So Huey used to say, as did many others, that uh, war is politics without bloodshed. Uh, no, war, no, politics is war without bloodshed and war is politics with bloodshed. But we can also say that war is profiteering in the capitalist world in the, in the first instance. And so uh, once again, you can see those stocks, they're gonna be going through the roof uh, tomorrow un unless the investor class is frightened about the world coming to an end. <laughs> I don't know, did you see Don't Look Up, the movie when they're contemplating the world coming to an end and how they're gonna profit from it? I mean, it, it, it's one of those scenarios we'll probably be faced with uh, on Wall Street tomorrow. On the one hand, greed, and on the other hand, fear. Those are the two primal instincts with regard to capitalism in general. Secondly, with regard to the growth of the ultra-right, not only in Ukraine, but I would also say in the United States of America as well, once again, it's, it's a miscalculation in part by our friends in the U.S. left because, you know, this gray hair is not dye. You know, I, I've been around for a few years and I, I'm old enough to recall a time during the Cold War when many of our friends on the left were saying, well, this current sort of left oriented around the Soviet Union is an albatross around our necks. Once we get rid of that, we'll see a thousand flowers bloom and you'll see the rise of social democracies and new socialist movement, new left-wing movements. Uh, I'm not, I don't think that that worked out like that. <laughs> I think what happened is like a seesaw when the left went down, the right went up. And that's the seesaw we're on now. I think what the left was doing, they remind me of, of the people, and th th this should resonate in, in, in New York, is, you know, you don't like, the landlord, so you move out of the apartment without having a new apartment hooked up. I mean, that seems to be a, be a recipe for homelessness. Or you quit your job because you don't like your coworkers and then go out and look for another job. Maybe you should get the new job first before you quit the job you have. And so uh, I think it was a bit of naive idealism on the part of our friends on the left which is contributed to, and plus, I don't see any sort of self-criticism, any sort of people looking back and doing some sort of analysis of, of how we got to this point. Uh, and instead, it's like it's like the old cliche, today is the first day for the rest of your life. Well, okay, fair enough, but what about what happened yesterday that got us to this so-called first day? So we're facing a very serious crisis. I mean, look at friends. You have elections coming up in a few weeks, a few months. And of course, I'm very critical of France because I think President Macron could have rallied his population uh, to effectuate his uh, stated goal of strategic autonomy uh, of the European Union. But of course, France is so dependent upon US satellite and aerial assets to maintain its neo empire in Africa that it becomes difficult to uh, break out of the US straitjacket. But in any case, you don't have to be a specialist in, on France to realize that it was not so long ago that you had strong socialist and communist parties in France. Now, if you look at Macron or the center right, most of his opponents are coming from the right. Zamor, Marie Le Pen, uh, Valérie Pécresse. I have a lot of respect for Mélenchon and Anna Hidalgo, uh, France unbowed, close to the communists and the socialists. But if there's any challenge to Macron, it's gonna come from the right. So how did that happen? Should, shouldn't we have an explanation uh, for that? And since I'm raising all these uh, questions historically, uh, perhaps I should also raise the question of Canada uh, because uh, you, you had this uh, experiment uh, 200 years ago where the uh, territories now called the United States of America rebelled against British rule, set up this new country, the United States of America. Canada did not rebel. Supposedly, a revolutionary republic was established here. 
But today, uh, Canada has the single payer healthcare system that we aspire to. Now, when you start saying this about Canada, I, you know, I've done this before. The U.S. left, then they start attacking Canada from the left. <laughs> Say, well, I'm not saying it's, it, it, I'm not saying it, it's paradise. I'm just saying it's more progressive than the United States. Don't you understand the concept of relativity? I mean, don't you understand that they have a, a new Democratic Party, a socialist-oriented party, representative problem? Then they start attacking the NDP from the left. It's not that progressive. Well, what, what kind of what about the Democratic Party? Which we come on, folks. I mean, stop this cover-up. Take the blinders off your eyes. Begin to look at reality and do an analysis of how we got to the brink of catastrophe and then come up with a prescription and a program that will allow us to dig ourselves out of the deep hole in which we now find ourselves. Um, th those are all the questions I have for you today. Is there anything you wanted to discuss that we haven't covered? Oh, no. I think that's about it. I think that's about it. Okay, well, I'm sure we'll have you back again soon. And we appreciate so much your time um, and, and your analysis. It's it just absolutely amazing. So thank you so much for coming on the show and look forward to having you back again soon. Thank you. Send me the link. <laughs>